Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 15th, 2014, and my guest is Chris Blattman of Columbia University. He works in development, poverty, and related subjects. He's the author with Paul Niehaus of a recent article in Foreign Affairs. The title is Show Them the Money, Why Giving Cash Helps Alleviate Poverty, which is the subject of today's episode. Chris, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. So you have been writing a series of articles and done a, a quite a bit of research, and we'll hope to get into to much of that, arguing that giving people cash rather than more complicated forms of development – uh, or welfare might be the right way to go for uh, helping people who are desperately poor. What's the basic argument? Well, the basic argument is not necessarily that cash is more effective uh, than other forms of assistance, but that it's effective relative to its cost. It actually can be, it isn't always, but it can be very, very, very inexpensive to deliver. And so if you have any kind of utilitarian view of the world and you want to help as many people as possible, uh, then then you pay attention to that. And so the question is, what is it good at? Uh, and the sort of a two-part answer, one is like anywhere, uh, people can use cash to buy the things they need. Maybe that's just shelter and food. And that can be here or that could be in the poorest country. Uh, but I think especially in a poor country where a lot of people have potential to uh, be self-employed, mainly because there aren't firms, so there aren't jobs, uh, they, they, um, they, they're held back from this self-employment because they don't have capital. And one of the cheapest ways to get them capital, they help out by a lot of things, uh, but one of the capital is really important and, and cash can just be a really effective way to put capital into their hands. But then the question is, is when, the poorest get cash, especially what people might think of as the more vulnerable or the more risky, high-risk young men, for example. Do they? What kind of decisions do they make with the cash? Uh, people aren't surprised that they don't have access to it, but I think they're, 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 the, the big question has been: Do they invest it, or do they spend it on "quote unquote" good things? Yeah, I, I want to. We'll get into some of the details of what your research and, and that of others has found, but I want to start with that philosophical question, which is the good things idea, economists generally, not always, but economists generally argue that people are pretty good judges of what is helpful to them and that mm -hmm. argues for giving people cash. Non-economists are very uncomfortable with that sometimes. They argue that they'll, quote, waste it on um, drugs and alcohol, for example, or other things that the giver might decide is frivolous. Uh, I assume you've heard that argument before, yeah, I've heard, and I and you know I, um, I I see that in myself every day. As it turns out, I I, the, I step outside my building in New York, and there's a guy in my corner who's asking for money, and and he doesn't seem completely well uh, mentally, uh, and and I hesitate to give him cash. So I, you know, here I am, this cash transfer evangelist of sorts and um, Mr. Cash Transfer. And, <laughs> I, I, not, I I will resist that particular label. It looks that way sometimes, but because I'm not I'm not really an evangelist for this. I, I I'm quite tempered, I think. But I, I don't give cash to him. I I might. I think I, I maybe the absence of evidence on this population in New York uh is what holds me back. But right now my wife and I give money to a, a charity that basically runs a food kitchen uh rather than uh cash out on the street to people who look quite poorly off. Yeah, I, I have a different perspective. I, well, I have no problem. I give money to, to food banks also, but I also mm -hmm. like giving cash to poor people, particularly if they're mm -hmm. going to – I hate to say this. It might offend some people, and I, I don't know if I've talked about this on Econ Talk before, but particularly if they're going to spend it on drugs and alcohol, I sometimes feel like it's good to give them cash because sometimes when you're desperately miserable, drugs and alcohol might be what you want and – People say to me, well, but don't – doesn't the donor have the right to, to decide what the money is spent on? Of course, the donor can earmark it. You can give to the food kitchen if you want or I can. But uh, 
uh, I like the idea that I respect the recipient and I treat the recipient like an adult, not like a child. And I don't decide Mm -hmm. for that person what's good for them. Uh, I let them make that decision and um, I think that's a dignified way to interact with desperately poor people even when they're a little bit uh, off the the beaten track as you point out person you're Mm -hmm. dealing with may not be uh, quote normal. So I think I think where a lot of us might draw the line uh, is we wouldn't want we wouldn't want to give people something that would lead them to hurt themselves or hurt others. And so, you know, it might be that your smartest capital investment is in, in the slums of Monrovia, which is one place we've given out cash to very high risk youth. It might be that your best investment is to buy a, is to buy an AK 47 and then to become a hold up artist. Uh, it might be that um, if you are addicted to substances that a large sum of money would you know, lead you to overdose. We were so, 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 and, 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 you know, that's different, I think, than the, you know, do I really care if, if, if they use it to smoke a joint or buy a, a bottle of booze? I don't think they're going to really hurt themselves or kill themselves. But there is this, we did confront this, these extremities with every day with, with one of the groups that we worked with in Liberia, which were these sort of high risk street youth. Uh, and, 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 and and so I think I think it's not so that so I think it's always there. But I think what's interesting is how seldom that, how much we exaggerate that, and how I think how much the average aid worker aid program, either in the U.S. or abroad, exaggerates that risk and and exaggerates I think their sense of paternalism and and what that does to programs in general. Well, of course, to some extent, it's an excuse, right? It, it says, well, I don't have to help this person because he'll he'll just waste it. And so, well, but but can even but those people. I mean, you look at organizations, and I work with organizations every day that their their whole their whole purpose and mission is to help people. And there's a real aversion sometimes, not always. Some people and some organizations have your attitude, but there's a real aversion to really giving that person agency, to really letting them decide, and and also to go with something as stripped down as cash. And I get reactions ranging from puzzlement to hostility, and initial reactions, I should say, from puzzlement to hostility, usually in the hostility range. Uh, people come around and people think about it and it forces conversations that I think have been really productive and interesting in the whole aid industry. That's the most powerful thing that's coming out of here. One of my co-authors on the foreign affairs piece calls uh, cash the index fund, the Vanguard index fund of development, in that it sort of becomes, a, a, in some sense, a, a benchmark for a lot of anti-poverty aid. It's just stripped down of all management costs and everything and and, and lets you see the impact of something that's very, very simple. And the argument on behalf of index funds, one of them is that those uh, transaction costs, those fees, which are small because index funds don't tend to be uh, – don't have the costs that the other funds have, those fees compound over time to make a significant, dramatic – small differences make a significant, dramatic difference. And I think we'll talk about it with some of your results that sometimes mm-hmm. a small difference – actually, it turns out not so small um, – uh, it makes a big difference. Just before we leave this topic, though, of of excuses, I think the challenge for aid agencies and and people in the um, in the helping game, and God bless them. You know, they're doing some. Many of them are doing extraordinary things on the ground, and I I salute them. But of course, they have a stake in the current system to some extent. And cash bypasses them, just like managers of actively managed funds are not so. We'll tell you what's wrong with index funds, so they're not really the best judge of necessarily. Of, of what's good for poor people. Yeah, that's yes and no. Uh, I mean, it, it's cash doesn't cash isn't a good index fund for a lot of different, maybe even most of what aid and state intervention does. Um, it's it's a it's a substitute for I think giving people stuff, uh, whether that's cows or blankets or bags of grain. Um, and it's it's a it might be a substitute for. You might even say it's a substitute for things like skills training programs, and and that giving people stuff and giving people training represents like a huge amount of anti-poverty assistance, but but still not maybe maybe not the majority of aid. So it's a substitute for a, a sense of stuff, and and I, I guess you're, I think the average organization would say, you know what, we would like to learn uh, what what we're better at and what we're worse at, and if there's a cheap substitute for this thing we're spending a lot of our time on and it lets us invest our energies in the thing where we really can add value and we are really good at, we would like to do that. Uh, I think, I think that's, that would be generally true. Now, whether or not they agree that cash uh, 
is that substitute is then in some sense evidence based in some sense ideological but but it's 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 so there's there's a lot there's a lot there still for aid i should say no i i totally agree with that um well, and we'll we'll continue to talk about this i'm sure as we get into the results but let's talk about a, a data point that's speaking of cows um you point out that uh it costs in west bengal india there's a nonprofit that spends uh $331. It costs $331 to have a cow given to someone via that agency, but the raw cost of the cow, the, the out-of-pocket for someone who had the money would, is only $166. So there's $166. Mm-hmm. So there's sort of 100% overhead in that, in that example that you give. Right. Um, that's important. It's, a big, it's an enormous difference for somebody whose income might be a few hundred dollars a year. Uh, giving them a cow – as you point out in the article, is great. Giving them $166 to choose to spend on a cow or maybe something else is, because maybe they don't really want a cow is um, might be a lot better. Yeah, and, and that's that's one of the most efficient programs around. I mean, we mentioned another one in Rwanda that provides a set of other services in addition to the cow, but it costs – it's 10 times as much. It's, I think it's about $3,000 a person is one estimate. And that, that in my experience, a lot of the programs I've seen look more like the $3,000 program. They're really gold-plated in some ways than the $300 program. It's a per-person cost uh, of a lot of programs is absurd when you, when you actually look at that. Most people don't look at that, actually. There's uh, very, almost no organizations do, and it's kind of a big surprise to them even when you, when you calculate those kinds of well, numbers. Of, it's kind of a wake-up call. Yeah. The- the one you, that one you mentioned, I think, is Heifer International. I love Heifer the name of it. But you said uh, in the article, the cost of donating a pregnant cow with attendant training classes and support services is three thousand dollars. Now, the services and training might be worth a non-trivial amount, right? But it is a mm-hmm. very, as you say, it's a gold-plated program. Well, this, you know, training programs in, in general really seldom pass a cost-benefit test. You know, we don't have a ton of evidence, so it's, we, that's not a universal statement, but. Um, the problem is anything that requires you to take educated people, whether those are elites from the capital or or some foreign person from another country, put them in a white SUV, fuel it with overpriced fuel and send them out for the day to some village to give somebody training. Like the cost for that alone is just is so high that you just and, – and these people who you're often helping are only making a dollar, two dollars a day. So the the amount you actually have to help them increase their earnings is so great. That that it you know it, it, that it's it all, it's really hard to imagine almost any of these types of interventions um, being being a pretty be, being being effective relative to something that can you know be sent over the wires or or now not even we don't even need wires anymore. So on the flip side, um, you quote the following numbers uh, that we give about in the United States we give about thirty billion in foreign aid um, collectively the. Developed wealthy countries give about 150 billion, and if we think of Paul Collier's bottom billion, uh, there's about 150 dollars uh, per capita then of aid. Of course, a lot of that doesn't go to the poorest people. It doesn't even isn't even intended to. It has other mm-hmm. purposes: foreign policy, helping contractors, or domestic builders, and et cetera. Um, it does suggest that. So, if we took that 150 billion and we could find a way to deliver it in cash. I do think it might have a much better impact an, on an annual basis. On the other hand, uh, it's a relatively small amount of money. Uh, and if if we really said uh, we're not going to try to achieve these foreign policy goals or whatever else is entangled with foreign aid, we're only going to try to help poor people, uh, we don't give very much money. So th- yes and no. Um, I mean the, the, the bottom billion may maybe earn – if they're earning a dollar a day, then getting a getting one hundred and fifty dollars more a year would would almost would increase their incomes by almost fifty percent every year, which is it's not bad when you're when you're making that little that little bit more is really really important. Um, but what's interesting this is this is where a lot of the research uh, has gone, including my own work, is is that this isn't just like a this just isn't one hundred fifty dollars that falls on you and you eat it and it and it and it. You're better off because you ate it, but it actually seems to unleash potential amongst people who are constrained by the absence of capital. And if that's true, uh, and 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 actually a regular transfer. There's some interesting research uh, 
by two fellows, Bobby and Bianchi and Bristad, I think a year or two ago, that uh, found that getting regular cash transfers can also uh, it can also help people overcome a second really important financial constraint, which is risk risk aversion and, and an absence of insurance. Uh, and, and essentially, two things happen. One is, is you don't have access to credit, you don't have access to insurance, and this is really going to inhibit the likelihood that you can and will invest any funds. Uh, if you're, if you have potential, if you're smart, if you're able, but you're very poor and you have no capital, then you're, you're below your, your, your earning potential. And if you give somebody this capital and if you give then then they're, they're likely to invest a big portion of it. And if they know they're going to actually get a minimum amount every year for the next few years, their evidence was from a Mexican program, Oportunidades, which gives conditional cash transfers. Then it then it also means that you're um, that you're actually more willing to take risks now with that money and invest in higher return enterprises and take chances and specialize. And so it, it, the the potential for that $150 every year to basically help people start their own businesses and expand those businesses, uh, and we can talk about some of the results from my own work in Uganda and Liberia and elsewhere. But that that it's not so it's not just helping people eat more; it's actually helping them increase their whole earning potential by relieving really important financial constraints. Yeah, that that is the that's the key. Obviously, we're we're, we're interested in a lot. The way I would phrase it is, we'd like to find a cure rather than just a painkiller. Uh, it'd be great to help people right. not suffer, but even better if we could help them rise to a level where they're actually well off. Um, now, yeah, you know, I wouldn't even call it a cure. I mean, you know, the cure in some sense is, that, you know, people, most people don't want to be entrepreneurs, right? This, this is just an interim, this is sort of a Band-Aid solution until these countries develop, you know, firms and low transaction cost financial markets. Uh, and that's probably 30 or 50 years off for a lot of these countries. And so, so it's still, it's still, but it, but it's, so it's more like they're better band-aids than, than others might, might be one way to think about it. Yeah. Good point. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize is that in all your work, uh, you're very, uh, restrained in your enthusiasm, which is something I am fond of and, and very much appreciate it. You've, your name's become associated with this idea of cash and yet you don't, uh, oversell it which uh, shows a unusual um, sense of humility and maturity in an economist. So I want to congratulate you, and I, I'm not kidding. Um, let's talk about – Well, I, I see what – even when I – when I and I, I try that at the same – and when I don't, uh, the, the wonderful thing about economists, especially journal referees, is they'll beat it into you. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, and so, so it's it's both it's sincere, but it's also enforced. So, yeah. so I won't take all the credit. Well, but so many of our colleagues managed to overcome that uh, those lessons. Uh, now, you're skeptical. I want to talk about some alternatives uh, and other uh, ideas that have been uh, championed as ways to to jumpstart growth. Uh, one mm-hmm. of them is microloans, which is awfully similar to cash. It's lending people mm-hmm. cash rather than giving it to them. The evidence for microloans is not so encouraging. Uh, give us a summary of that and then give me some idea why cash might be different, at least uh, in, in the experiments that you've been involved in. Mm-hmm. Well, so people clearly like microloans. Okay, the, By revealed preference, some, I'm sure there's a billion or two billion people with microloans in the world today. I don't know. Maybe somebody has the numbers. I don't have them at my fingertips, but it's a lot and it's just been explosive growth. So clearly, clearly people want this and, and, and it does a lot of good things. Uh, it, it helps smooth out shocks for one thing. And, and it also, um, I guess people, it seems that people don't like borrowing when they can from family and friends. They like to depersonalize their finance. Depersonalized finance is something we like. Uh, and and even if we don't mind some personalized finance having another another place in our portfolio, something else to put away a little money in, or somewhere else to borrow from, in addition to the 20 other places and 20 other people we're borrowing from, is always a good thing when you live a risky life. So so it's providing a lot of 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 it's some flexibility and some comfort and some security for people. But what it's not doing is it's not pulling people out of poverty uh, because people generally are not using this to make investments, whether it's investments in schooling so that you earn more, your kids earn more many years down the road, 
or investments in starting a small enterprise. And the reason for that is probably because the interest rates are very, very high. So, you know, there's there's data now from places like Ghana and Sri Lanka and Uganda uh, and elsewhere and what people do and how much they earn when they get cash, when they get capital. And you see these returns to capital among the poor of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 percent. So these are big returns. People in some places seem to double their money. Um, and on average, which means that within that group, there's people who can do even better. But the rates of interest in a lot of these microloans can be five, often 10% per month, even the nonprofit ones. So these turn into annualized interest rates well above 100% per year in many cases. Not always. Some are lower. Some are like 20 or 30%. But you have to have a pretty high return opportunity, whether it's sending your kid to school or a business, that, that you just have to be really, really, really good at that and really, really, really constrained for you to use, for you to borrow at those rates to run that business. So unless microfinance can get down to really, really low rates of interest, like I, I don't know what that would be. I'm guessing five or 10 or 15% per year. I'd be skeptical if that ever becomes a vehicle for the poor expanding their own businesses. Do we know anything about the default rates? Yeah, you know, I'm not. Uh, you know, we're starting to brush up against the my ignorance here. I I don't think default rates. The thing that's driving the cost of borrowing is generally, my understanding, it's not default rates. It's the fact that these are very very small loans, maybe fifty or hundred or a few hundred dollars at most. And it just costs money. There's just all sorts of really mon mundane transaction costs associated with finding those people, screening them, getting them the money, the payment plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and that's, a big, that's a big impediment. I think this is one of the reasons that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think, stepped back when they started thinking about what is really important, what is nobody else working on, what can they do as a technology-inspired uh, organization uh, foundation is that they, one of their big efforts has been on trying to figure out ways to reduce financial costs and savings and credit uh, precisely through technology in many in many cases just so that they can lower these transaction costs and thus make financial markets work better for the poorest. Well, what's interesting as you say those things is that the those transaction costs and default risk and identifying the people. Many ways, those are the equivalent of the overhead of the three hundred thirty-one dollar cow instead of the one hundred sixty-six dollar cow, and it kind of highlights again cash as an index fund, the sort of low cost, mm -hmm. uh, low, uh, not as ambitious, but maybe more effective because of its cost. L let's talk briefly about uh, the Millennium Villages project, which uh, we, we've, of course, uh, listeners will know that we've spoken about that pro program here with Nina Monk and then Jeffrey Sachs. It, it purports to aim very high rather than saying, well, we're going to have a 50 percent or 100 percent increase in income with the cash infusion. We're going to do everything at once. We're going to give training. We're going to help people with skills. We're going to give them some capital. We're going to work on infrastructure. That would seem to be uh, an effective way – that would seem to be a lot more effective in cash, and yet many people are skeptical of its effectiveness. Uh, what are your thoughts? So um – you know, I, it's such a big, uh, it's, it's such a big topic in some ways. The the Millennium Villages are so so so. I remember thinking, you know, people, I, I've, and I've talked to them a little here and there. You know, Jeff Sachs is a colleague here at Columbia, of course, and and I've chatted with them informally about their evaluation plans and how they would, and I and I thought about. Would I recommend that they actually have comparison villages where they just give the equivalent in cash? Would that be a should I should I recommend the index fund approach? Um, and I thought, you know what, that's not quite. I'm not sure what we would. I'm not sure that's what the millennium. I've never been sure that's what the millennium villages are actually doing. I'm not sure if it's giving them the stuff, whether it's the technology or the resources that is actually making the millennium villages successful to the extent that they're successful. Uh, yeah, I have no doubt that they're impactful. You know, you give people stuff. You give inputs. There's more output. I think we we don't need a we don't. This isn't this isn't this isn't like a mysterious formula. We don't, yeah. that, um, but uh, you know, you read Nina Monk's book, and you you know, 
and everybody should who's read it should go back and reread it in my opinion they should throw out all the stuff about megalomania and 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 whatnot um and pay attention to what actually the stories that she tells in the villages and they were so informative to me having never visited one the first thing that happens is the people who are essentially the development officers who are in charge of these villages or who live in these villages and are in charge of the planning are smart and they do their jobs um so in some sense the public servant uh does their job right which is not what's happening in most of the other villages in the country uh, and they're doing their job right because they're well, internally motivated, but also because everybody's watching. Yes, yeah, someone's paying attention. Yeah. And then secondly, um, they're also really good lobbyists. So there was this one story where he, I think, he, this guy in northern Kenya lobbies. I, you can't, don't quote me. It was something like he lobbies the the regional government to put the market. They're going to put a market somewhere. They're going to put the road somewhere, and they put it all in his village. Right, and so that's another thing that got right, and and that might actually be exclusive in the sense that not everybody can get that. Right, that's actually only some villages, and not others, can get that. And so, but again, that's an aspect of like collective action and governance. So I wonder to what extent the Millennium Villages and any success they generate is about inputs, and how much of it is actually about just getting governance right, for lack of a better term. Well, it's a huge part uh, of it, and, obviously. Yeah, and so 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 cash and so whether or not cash is a, so at that point cash isn't really you can't you know cash isn't necessarily a substitute for that unless it maybe generates the same observation effects I don't think it would ever generate the governance effects and so this is a good illustration of the limits of cash cash is never going to replace um, good governance as as which is maybe one of the most fundamental drivers of causes and consequences of development and. And and the, the worrying thing is, of course, cash on a really, really large scale um, has the potential to make governance either much better or much worse if governments were to move to really, really large scale cash transfer programs. Yeah, it's a different level of experiment than, than has been run in most of these cases. That's a different – that that would be another interesting but, of course, very expensive uh, randomized, randomized control trial to give some people very large sums of money rather than, say, building a road. Uh, obviously, right. collective action, people privately building a road might be challenging. It might not be the thing that happens, but maybe something else would happen that would be also good. Who knows? Well, let's talk about mm -hmm. let's talk about your work. Uh, let's start with the Uganda work, uh, which you you have a couple of um, of research projects in, in in papers in that area. Let's start with the one where um, in northern Uganda, where the government gave out uh, money to groups of people who who asked for it. Or who applied for it? Talk about how that project was constructed. Uh, how did it happen, by the way, to start with? How did the government come to think it might be a good idea to have essentially a, a it sounds like a business plan competition and give out money mm -hmm. based on that? It's very unusual. Uh, it is and it isn't. So, you know, the it's actually a problem if you're the World Bank or if you're a government. And so this was actually a World Bank credit to the government if you're, of Uganda. If you're the World Bank and you're a government and you want to spend increasing amounts of aid and you want it to be very pro poor and you want it to be get out into the hands of the poor, it's actually a real problem to figure out how you're going to spend $100 million because you, you have to disperse it and you have to do that pretty quickly, uh, even if that's even if quickly means a few years. And so you, you end up being forced to consider a set of you know a set of strategies that basically are like basically dropping money out of helicopters and and this is a really really common form of aid in Africa you sometimes you'll hear them called community driven development programs and communities will get 10 or 20,000 dollar grants and they merely have to come up with some sort of plan for building a bridge or improving the school and and it's it's popular because it's decentralized it's popular because it's often participatory and that the village is having a say and so we think that maybe they have better information than the central planner uh it's popular because it's these are often quasi democratic or maybe more democratic decision making processes so all sorts of things with them that make these a really really popular program for donors and governments um and and then governments don't mind them uh, because they, they they think they're going to get political rewards for dropping cash on people. Uh, they might like to drop cash on people they prefer to get it, and they can they can't do that sometimes. But they you know they they're they're open to this. Um, 
And so it's a small step from these community-driven development programs, which are so common, to community group programs, where all of a sudden you you get a group of youth who want to get training or start businesses, and you just drop money on them. And that was the little trick that the Ugandan government and the World Bank used to sort of justify this to themselves and to make it all look... The, the World Bank doesn't, and the government's don't necessarily want to be in the business. I think they should, but they don't necessarily want to be in the business of transferring money to people's mobile phones. Uh, but they can kind of convince themselves that it's not that if they give to groups and if it looks like these community-driven development things. So that's how it came up. The, the, the World Bank gave a $300 million credit to the government of Uganda for local development. Most of it was for community-driven development, and they added on this piece, which was going to give money to groups of like 20 young people who had applied for, uh, who who'd said, give us $8,000 and we will go off and get our own training and buy our own tools and start a bunch of vocations. And the 20 is, as you point out in the paper, uh, the, in the quarterly journal of economics, uh, you point out in the paper that some of that was just for, to keep the administrative costs down. It's easier to give money to a group, a small number of groups, than a larger number, 20 times larger group of, individu of individuals. But how many of these applications with, say, 20 people, I think the average was 22, the average group size, did they want to do something as a group as opposed to just split the money up and go get their own training each individually? How many of them proposed firms? Any of them? N almost none. Um, none of the ones I saw, I should say, and certainly none of the ones we funded. Um, now, they, they were quasi-cooperatives in the sense that they would often, if they had to buy something heavy and big, like a welding machine, if they were going to do welding, and they'd share the welding machine in some fashion. Uh, and and if they went off to do their own separate trades as welders or carpenters or tailors, when they got big jobs, they might take them on jointly uh, in order to manage it. Or, or they might be congregating in the same place, so they might get contracted at the same time. So in a very informal in, in fluid sense, they acted a little bit like temporary cooperatives. Um, but for the most part, they worked on their own. Uh, and they, they this is what they envisioned from the beginning. And what did – talk about the magnitudes of the money that were involved and um, and what, what happened. So it was, it was $8,000 on average for the group. Groups varied in size and the amount they requested varied a little bit in size. But that, that was what it was. And so it worked out to about $400 on average per person which is roughly their annual income for the year. Uh, so, you know, in, in, I remember at the time I was really skeptical of this and I it, it felt like an albatross around my neck. I didn't know why I was evaluating it. I did not expect it to show up in the QJE uh, several years later, to say the least. Um, I was very skeptical. I thought I, I had this instinct that there was no way that these guys were going to make sensible decisions with the money. I had a very low initial expectation of what the impact was going to be. And and what they did and the results uh, surprised me. Uh, for the most part, I, I, I'd say about three quarters of the guys who – so when they got the money, most of the group typically shared. It was – in almost no case did one of the executive members run off with the whole sum. And in very few cases was, was somebody excluded entirely from the benefits. So that was the first thing that surprised me. Uh, the second thing that surprised me was that – of the people who uh, shared in the benefits, something like I think three quarters of them enrolled in some vocational training. They only spent about 15% of the money they received on vocational training. It was interesting that they there are a lot of little small institutes of varying quality around Uganda, and they they hired their own, uh, and so and they were in charge of all those decisions. Nobody said you have to go to this school or whatever, and so they spent about 15% of the money on this, and more than three quarters use that to get a few weeks or a few months of training. And then they spent most of the rest of the money on tools and materials in order to become carpenters or welders or metal workers or tailors or run hair salons. Those are the most common ones. And these, and are, these are young people and it's a mix of men and women, correct? Yeah, it's a mix of men and women. It was about a third women and it was, uh, you know, they're mostly in their 20s and 30s, which is a quote unquote youth in Africa. Youth means youth is a social category. It means you're not a child and not an elder, essentially. Uh, and and they uh, and and then they they then generally worked. Nobody, almost nobody, 
quit their other work and just became a carpenter or hair salon person full time, you most people don't do that. And when you're very, very poor, you usually do two or three or four things. You farm, you raise some animals, you do a little petty business, you uh, maybe you learn it. If you have the, the capital, you learn a trade and you practice that. And so they ended up working five or six hours a work week on average more. And they, they were working those five or six hours a week in their trade. A lot, and they were doing it alongside all the other stuff they were doing. And, and to make it, and, but to make it, it yeah. it's important to point out they don't work very many hours in the formal sector to start with. So five or six hours is a big right. increase. I think it's twelve. Right, they're the only average. working maybe. Yeah, exactly. And so at the end, I think they, 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 they go from something like I don't remember the exact number, but say it was like from twenty to twenty six hours compared to like so the control group I think might have been working twenty hours a week and miscellaneous things, and these guys might have been working twenty six. I don't, uh, I don't remember the exact estimate, but that's close enough. Um, and anyways, and then, and, 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 and that's not everybody. Some people fail or they no longer work. I think it was about half after four years. So we followed them up after two and after four years. And after four years, about half were engaged in some kind of trade. Uh, and some of them had even hired other people, although usually they'd hire other people to do agricultural work or something, but there were then, but there was, it was generating employment and their earnings were higher. Their, their earnings, uh, were up by about 40% on average, uh, compared to the control group. So that's a stunning giant number, which got your attention. I, and it got the QJE, the quarterly journal of economics attention too, obviously. Um, were you, as you say, you were surprised. How do we explain that? Uh, well, the first thing I'll say is it's, it's, it's a, it's a stunning proportion in, in, in absolute terms. It's not actually that big a number. This, if you're only making 10 or $20 a month and increasing that 40%, it is is a is a small absolute number, but it's, it's really meaningful. You know that that the marginal utility from 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 a forty percent increase when you're earning that little is actually really high. So there's that caveat. But um, so what explains that is I think this idea of of credit constraints. The idea of that these are young people, young people, the world around. Uh, have accumulated a certain amount of human capital, even if that's not formal education, you know, you, you grow up, you learn to be a functioning human being, and now you're an adult, you're released into the world. Uh, and you're probably below your potential in the sense that you, you haven't accumulated all of the assets and capital and things that you'll one day be able to use to make money. And you accumulate that slowly over time. Uh, and, and if you start behind, especially because you're very poor, what a cash grant to a young person can do is essentially jumpstart them. Uh, so it, 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 it essentially it helps, it helps you reach your potential sooner. So what we saw in the control group was that, especially the men, less so the women, what we saw with the men in the control group is that they were, over the four years, they were saving and investing their capital, mostly in petty business, not in vocations, because vocations required this big lump sum payment they could never afford. But they'd start a lot of petty business and, and they were increasing their earnings and they were increasing their uh, employment steadily over time. And presumably that'll just keep going up over time till it reaches some, you know, maybe when they're 40, that's, that's where they'll get to. Uh, and our guys were just consistently ahead of them. Uh, and what we probably did, if, I'm sure if we followed them up in 20 years, they might look the same and they'll look the same and quite, and much richer. What we helped them do is essentially get a five or 10 year jump start on, on their potential because they were able to get this capital right away. Now, I know you looked at a lot of different aspects of these, of the activities of the people who got the money versus those who didn't. Um, anything about self-esteem in there that stood out? I, I, one thing I, that struck me when you think, Again, our earlier conversation, oh, we can't give them money. They'll just waste it or they'll, they'll have a big party or they'll, they'll be profligate with the money. But they weren't. They mm -hmm. were – because they're desperately poor uh, and they're not stupid. They, uh, they took care of that money and they used it to make their future brighter. Uh, did it – besides the financial aspect, were there any measurements of their well-being or, or other aspects of, of daily life that you measured that were different? So we we focused. I think we'll we'll go back in the near future, and I think we're going to try to focus on esteem and psychological well-being much better than we did. Uh, we were actually intrigued and focused a lot on what it did to their social status and their social interactions in the community. Uh, if they were women, the extent to which this was empowering, in that maybe they had more independent decision making and autonomy. 
Uh, and we were also interested in aggression uh, because this is a this was a post-conflict scenario. Now, this wasn't a highly conflict-affected population, but there were some opportunities for aggression, certainly everyday aggression and crime, and there were uh, some opportunities for anti-government protests. And so that's where we, we spent a lot of our time and energy. And what we found is that it's very little, as it turns out. And this has been consistent across several of the studies I've looked at uh, where we found these really large increases in employment and income, is that people's social support and family support uh, increase a little bit. Uh, you know, when you're a net giver into the social system, maybe it's always a little less stressful and you have a little bit more support than otherwise, but it's very small and not always significant. Uh, I actually expect it to be much larger, especially, you know, in Africa, when you're a young person, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a net taker from the kin network rather than a net giver, you usually have a very different social status. And we didn't see that. Um, so maybe maybe we overestimate that um, in in reality. Uh, the we didn't see any change in aggression, and we didn't see any change in anti-government attitudes or protest behavior. Um, we thought we would, and there were some hints we would. But there were some hints we'd see a decrease in male aggression, and we did not. In the end, when we went and measured it really well after four years. Now the women had a much bigger impact than the men in the sample. I think. Uh the women had increases on average over the four years of about 70 percent relative to the control group and only 28, I think, was, was my memory of the – for the men, still not a, mm -hmm. a large number. But did, did you think about or look into why that might be? Did the women have opportunities they were cut off from that the capital or the skills made a big difference? Well, so I think the women's – Reaction to the women who get the program look very similar in trajectory. They start off more poor. They start off poor on average than the men, uh, but their trajectory looks very similar to the men who get the intervention as well. So you might think their returns to capital are very similar. What drove the difference was that the control women stagnated in the absence of the intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, the control women is it, just a flat line in real incomes, which is, un which is unlike the, the control men who, as I mentioned, managed to save older, by saving a little yeah. bit and earning a lot, you know, accumulated over time. So, so then it's a puzzle, which we don't really, you know, we, we can, we have some ideas. We don't have a clear answer. The puzzle then is why did the, why, what was it about the control women that prevented them from accumulating? Um, it might've been the fact that women in general, because they start off poor, anyone who starts off much poorer, is less likely to accumulate. They're, they're essentially almost too. They're, they're so far below their, their their earnings are so low they can't save their way out. Um, we see a little bit of that, but it doesn't seem to. And, and I don't think it really explains it all. So it's a little bit of a puzzle. It might also have to do with the social status of these women and in general or in the household. Maybe if you get a big dump of money, then it's okay for you to start a business. If not, then maybe circumstances work against you. Uh, talk about what you did in, uh, in Liberia. So the way I got into a lot of this employment work, I'd, I'd been working in northern Uganda studying the war that had recently ended. It was still going on when I, when I worked there. It was, it was ended when we ran this intervention that we've been discussing, but I was looking at the impacts of the war and, and who participated and why and some of the determinants of, of why men rebel. And a lot of my work on employment programs was partly because I was interested in how employment programs can reintegrate and help people recover from conflict, but also because I was interested in this this idea that comes from the economics of crime and some of the economics of rebellion that, that greed is a motivator. And, and if you improve the economic opportunities to men, uh, will they be less likely to rebel? You know, this is, we, we, we believe this is true. We have a lot of indirect evidence to suggest this is true. We don't have any individual level evidence outside maybe a few, you know, a couple of youth programs in the United States that this is true. It's an opportunity cost uh, argument, right? The argument is, is exactly. that if you have a pleasant job, you're less likely to head to the street. Right. So, so does that apply to rebellion? I guess is the big question. And so I went looking for uh, a place in a population who, uh, where it was safe enough to work, but where there was a pretty, pretty, pretty good likelihood of an opportunity to rebel, or at least maybe an opportunity to engage in election thuggery and, and, and intimidation and, 
and other types of uh, illicit activities and crime and ended up sort of in some ways by chance in Liberia, which, uh, so this was maybe 2008 when I started working there and the board ended in 2003. And there was this, you know, increasingly less fragile peace in the sense that it was, the country was really stabilizing and growing. There was a UN peacekeeping force. But uh, when I went there, there were probably 10 or 20,000 men in urban slums uh, who many of whom were ex-combatants, were very poor, were engaged in petty crime, and were seen as a real risk to security at any time, whether it's rebellion breaking out at home, rebellion breaking out in neighboring countries, and them being recruited as mercenaries. There's a long tradition of that in the, in the neighborhood, um, and, and also attraction into crime. And the UN estimated there was maybe 10,000 mostly ex-combatant, high-risk young men in what they called hot spots around the country. So little resource rich areas like diamond, diamond and alluvial diamond and gold mining areas and rubber plantations and logging areas. And these young men were occupying those areas and illegally extracting these resources, preventing the government essentially from selling these concessions to, uh, or either returning the concessions to the firms or the families that owned them or, uh, selling those concessions off and this, essentially this is going to be the main way that Liberia recovers its economy. And what happened? Okay, so uh, we stumbled upon one program that looked really promising that had nothing to do with cash. They were very, very opposed to the idea of cash, but what they were willing to do and planning to do was to go into some of these hot spots and persuade these young men to uh, – to put down their, you know, mining picks and things, and 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 go and learn to be farmers in a residential training center, and uh, and and then after four months of training, return and become farmers. And they gave them $125 in in capital to return home. And at the same time, we we started our own project where we, it's actually about a year later, we started our own project where we started working with their urban counterparts. These also large ex-combatant men, also engaged in legal activities. In this case, it was more drug dealing and petty crime uh, in the urban slums of Monrovia. And we experimented with two interventions. One was a pure cash transfer of $200. And the other one was, um, uh, you could think of it as an eight-week program of therapy, looking a little bit like cognitive behavior therapy in the sense that they're practicing and learning uh the objective was them to sort of practice and learn self-control in both a aggression and a personal and a financial sense. And the other objective was for them to adopt, I, I guess you could say, good behaviors uh, in the sense that they know what's right and wrong. Um, you don't have to tell them it's bad to steal or bad to use drugs. And they know that society thinks it's wrong, but they don't necessarily feel like they have to live by those rules because they're not part of that group. So it was also trying to persuade them that they want to be and could be part of like, quote unquote, good society. What happened? So um, interestingly, so in the, the first one where there was this ex-combatant reintegration giving training and capital, um, they... Uh, they do very well. They actually are interested in becoming farmers, which I didn't know. I didn't expect. A lot of people didn't expect. Most people are interested in becoming farmers. And you give them the skills and capital, and they uh, and they farm more. They actually ended up uh, shifting about 20% out of these illicit resource activities and shifting about 20 or 30% into farming activities. So they were they were pretty fully employed. Unlike the guys in Uganda, these guys could fill up 50 hours a week of work. Uh, they just shifted and they, and they had a portfolio of things they were doing, petty business and illicit resource extraction and like the mining and farming. And they just mixed their portfolio differently towards farming. And what's interesting though is nobody exited, very few people exited the the illegal resource mining and the illegal rubber tapping. Uh, they just shifted their mix. And this is actually similar to what Steve Levitt and Sudhir Venkatesh found with Chicago drug gangs. The, you know, when, when outside market opportunities improve, they don't exit drug dealing. They just do less drug dealing and more McDonald's work or something like that. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that uh, uh, some of the guys ended up not getting the capital inputs. Um, about a third of them chose uh, 
the, the chose animals as their capital inputs, and about two thirds chose some kind of farming, like vegetables. And and it's and, and actually the, the, they all, they look almost identical to our surprise, depending on what you chose. But if you chose animals, there was this supply interruption. Turns out it's really really hard to get pigs and chickens into Liberia. You have to fly them in from Guinea and on like army army planes, and they don't survive the journey. Uh, and it's terrible. So the, a year later, more than a year later, when we were running our, our follow-up study, um, these guys had not received their, uh, their chickens and pigs. And they'd been promised in maybe a month or two, we'll, tr- we'll try to either get you those, or if not, we'll give you a cash equivalent, about $100. Um, and so what was really interesting, so maybe as you'd expect, the guys who didn't get the capital had not shifted into farming. They hadn't farmed more. But they were mining less, and they were illegally extracting rubber less. And the reason was because you had to go off into the bush and maybe a few days away to do that. And if you did, you might miss hundred dollars. So big delivery. Uh, I, I have an image. Yeah, of, exactly. I have an image of the Amazon drone um, program here, having a <laughs> playing a key role. I see pigs flying. Right. It's, a, it's a world that can't be imagined. Really. <laughs> what happened to the What happened to the people who just got cash? Well, let me actually tell you one more thing that's interesting about this is that the the, the moment we started running our – sorry, shortly before we ran, ran our follow-up study, a war broke out in neighboring Cote d'Ivoire. There was an election disp- – there was a disputed election, both sides armed. There's increasing violence and then full-scale war for about a month or two until a French invasion force came in and ended it. And uh, in the meantime, a few Liberian generals went over and started recruiting Liberian ex-combatants. And they really only pulled about 500 over, and they were almost Cote, all from Cote d'Ivoire generals. I think you said Cote d'Ivoire is a, na- a neighboring, right neighboring country with long, you know, deep ties on either side. So they just go over, and you know, it's the kind of thing you can walk to the border in several days. Um, and they mostly pulled them from the urban center, from Monrovia, and, and from some border towns where we weren't working. So nobody in our study went, as far as we can tell. But um, what was also interesting is, but all these recruitment activities started up. So the the generals and and all of these sort of minions and people through the they started, you know, holding recruitment meetings. And there started to be informal talk of contracts. Like if I come with a truck with and I give you five hundred dollars, will you get on? No, if no, a thousand dollars, would you get on the truck? Hmm. Um, you know, people would start moving to the border towns to be ready to be recruited. So these are some of the things. And the um, the guys who the, the people in the program were about 25% less likely to participate in these recruitment activities, or at least tell us they participated in these recruitment activities. And it was almost all, it was, it was concentrated in the guys again, who were waiting for the cash. Uh, they were the ones who, because again, it would, they'd have to leave the community and they'd miss their hundred dollars for sure. And then they'd start their farm. And so they essentially compared I've got my skills to sunk cost. I can get $100 and then start my farm and stay here, or I can take $500 to jump on this guy's truck, and then who knows what happens to me. And so they, 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 they were more interested in the, in the $100 option. And any longer-term effects akin to the Uganda returns that you saw? So we haven't um, we haven't gone back for those. So those were essentially 18 months after the baseline survey, 14 months after they finished the training, and we uh, we could go back now for essentially like a three or four year impact assessment. And I think I'm not sure it's. I think I think we're waiting to for. I think it became it was interesting in large part because of the war breaking out. I think you know we might wait a little while and um, and see if if there's some other opportunity for them to participate in violence that we go and measure. This is the this is the tricky part when you this is the moral the quandary when you work in this this kind of uh study field is that you you know you don't you know what the consequences of violence are and you really and you work on this because you want to minimize it. Uh at the same time, you know, you your entire research career is hinges upon you being able to find and measure these systems of conflict. You end up being like the the either the tornado hunter the tornado chaser or the or the guy who sits there and some small part of you kind of hopes for the tornado to come down no matter how bad you think it is. Uh, and so anyway, so we're going back and if that happens and if not, it's not clear it's worth it. But wasn't the original – wasn't one of the key findings that that the people who got the cash didn't, quote, squander it 
uh, on drugs so, and alcohol. So this is yeah. So this this brings us. So the whole time we were doing this, we were thinking, well. Gosh, so here's – this cash seems to be really important. We think they can spend cash well. We think you're wrong to mistrust them with cash and only give them in-kind capital. And then it looked like this cash was really important to their decision not to go. Uh, so when we tried this with the the street youth in Monrovia, a lot of whom were these petty criminal guys engaged in petty crime and, and who were ex-combatants, um, we were worried – we were actually really, really worried that they would use it to buy guns or they would – uh, get beaten up or stolen from, or that they would overdose because a lot of guys were casual and some serious drug users. Uh, and so we started with 100 guys that we recruited, and 25 got cash, and 25 got this uh, therapy program, and 25 got both, and 25 got neither. It was a, a random draw. They drew balls out of a bag with different colors. And we watched them really closely. Um, going back after two weeks and four weeks and five months and seven months uh, to be really careful that they no harm came to themselves and they didn't do harm to other people. And we were kind of amazed. There were almost no cases of this. Um, they seemed to save and invest the cash for the most part and very little seems to have been spent on drugs. And so we expanded over time to a thousand people once we were comfortable with this model. And this is what we found. We found that when these guys get cash, and these are the guys, these are the last people on the planet you might think we ought to be giving cash to. Uh, maybe not the last people, but like second or third to last. And because you think they, they might do harm to others or harm to themselves, and, and, uh, and at the very least they might waste it. And we didn't find this at all. Almost overwhelmingly, the money was saved or invested in some kind of small enterprise or in getting clothes or getting some decent shelter because a number of these guys were homeless or often homeless. Uh, and and we saw virtually no increase. They still spent money on drugs and alcohol and gambling and cigarettes and all the other things they spent money on, but they didn't spend any more than before. I uh, I can't help but think of um, the H.L. Mencken line, which I don't quite get right, but it's something along the lines of um, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere is having a good time. <laughs> and um, so they were having a good time, but no more. You didn't subsidize it. You didn't finance it. Um, you let them do some other things, which is um, which is very um, – it's very moving actually thinking about it. Well, and they tried – you know, it's different with the Uganda. They, like the Uganda guys, a lot of them tried to start petty enterprises. They'd go and they'd buy big boxes of soap or one guy bought a big tub of liquor from a distillery and they'd go and they'd sell it. Uh, and they, that, that's, that's kind of how you make your living or they'd get a wheelbarrow or a blanket and they'd sell stuff out of the wheelbarrow or on the blanket. Um, and, and which is, which is what you do to get by in a lot of these markets in Liberia. What's interesting and a little bit surprising is that, um, they were back where they started a year later. So they'd had a better year. They ate better. They had better housing. They, all the things that we want for the very, very poorest, uh, when we give say, any kind of welfare assistance, but they didn't, they didn't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and it didn't catapult them ahead. Like in, no jump in start. Uganda. And no. yeah. Um, and it might be that the 200 wasn't enough, or it might be that something else held them back. And, and one thing that cropped up, we don't have, as, the data's not as good on this as I'd like, but one thing that cropped up was, was property rights for lack of a better description. Uh, the, they just had their stuff stolen from them, whether it was their wares or their profits or whatever it is that they bought for themselves. A lot of it just got stolen and pilfered over time because they lived in these insecure environments. And a lot of the stuff was stolen by the police. Well, that comes back to the governance issue. And I, I, I'm thinking about um, Bill, Easterly, Bill Easterly's recent episode and book, The Tyranny of Experts. Um, in some of these places, I, I hate to say it, you want violence or something. You want, you want something to stop the current system which oppresses people, doesn't give them op options, doesn't allow them to use their skills. Um, I don't know what kind of government Uganda or Liberia have. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, giving the money to pacify them and to keep them out of the violent sector is on the surface probably a good thing, but maybe not in a place where there's tyranny. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, most states in Africa are too weak to be tyrannical. Uh, they end up being these sort of hybrid, autocratic, democratic regimes. Uh, 
that aren't tyranny. You, you actually have to be a pretty capable state with a strong bureaucracy and a good police service and things to, to be an effective totalitarian uh, and, and dictator. So, so um, what you tend to see, another, you know, there's lots of different types of regimes. What you tend to see are uh, increasingly, or I think some people call them like hegemonic parties. So on, on the paper, it's democracy, and there are elections, and they might even be reasonably free elections, but this one party and sometimes this one leader just continually gets reelected. Um, and, and they're sort of autocratic in their approach and they repress like just an, enough. It's, it's like an American become. city. Uh, yeah, you know, one party rule, uh, petty oppression and corruption. Not, 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 you're right. It's not dictatorship. It's not, mm -hmm. not just a cheap shot. Sorry. Go ahead. I apologize. No, no. I, another example closer to home is Mexico under the PRI uh, for many years until. And so, so, um, so, so he, here's what's interesting actually about the Uganda case is that Uganda is a perfect example of the sort of hegemonic party. The guy who's president has been president since 1986, and he's pretty good in, in many ways. You know, the, the economy has been growing. Uh, there are more human rights enjoyed in the country, and more press and political freedoms than at many points in the country's history, uh, it's still not completely free. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and they, he needs to maintain a lot of support. He wants to maintain as much popular support as possible. And so, and, and he's, and, and so throwing out money to these underdeveloped rural constituencies, especially the north of the country where he hasn't historically had support, seems like a good idea. And so they probably thought that with the, the political returns were going to be good. Uh, we wanted to see this, so we went back and we were working with the World Bank and the government at first uh, for the two-year survey. And and they literally took a, they took a red pen. I guess they want to know the answer, but they didn't want it published, or they didn't want it. They didn't really want to know, and they didn't want to seem to be asking. It seemed to be what's going on. So they took a red pen to the survey, and they cut all the political questions. So we didn't. We weren't able to see what the effects were on political support. Uh, I think they were scared to be seen to be opportunists. Mike, uh, so we went back. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I see. We went back after four years, and 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 with private money. And went and asked those questions, um, at which point we were allowed, had the right permissions, but they just didn't want to be the ones to be asking. And what we found was interesting is that, if anything, the people who got the money and the communities that got the money uh, supported the government no more. Uh, in fact, they supported them even a little bit less, um, not always significantly so. What was interesting uh, is people, people who got the program were actually more likely to support the opposition and support them openly, meaning they'd attend rallies or they'd work on behalf of the opposition. Yeah, I just can't help but think about whether uh, the world would be a better place if the World Bank didn't um, do that kind of thing. If – even though it helps some people and, and raises their well-being a little bit, it, it keeps the system in place that's maybe not so um, not so good for poor people. <laughs> Well, that's what's interesting about this result is it's you know I think I would have I would have thought that this is the danger. The World Bank is essentially strengthening the hegemony of this hegemonic party, and yep. what it might actually be doing is the opposite. So much we haven't published this result yet. It's we've talked about it, and so um, and so I'll be interested to see how the government reacts when they see it. They probably won't notice, but it 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 suggests that it may be. And and there's a few other people who found similar stuff in. Indonesia and here and there that when people get richer, uh, when the poorest get richer, in some sense, they're a little harder to buy off and they, they maybe vote with their ideas and their heart or their principles more than their pocketbook. Uh, and, and that would be consistent with what we find. Uh, and so, so in some sense, inadvertently, the, 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 these kinds of programs, these decentralized programs that essentially are giving a lot of agency to the poor and helping them get wealthier might actually strengthen uh, uh, democratic accountability and freedom in the long run. It's a nice thought. I wonder. It's, big, it's a big extrapolation. But no, no, it, I think you know. it's interesting. I think it's, I mean, it's a fascinating thought. I think it's, uh, my worry would be that when the Ugandan government finds that out, they'll just make sure the World Bank channels that money differently. But we'll we'll see. We're out of time. I, I want to. Yeah, well, I think. Oh, sure. No, go I, ahead. Well, I was going to say what 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 these what 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 weak states in Africa have to and will learn to do is learn to target that money better towards supporters. I think that's the danger. I think the danger point maybe with aid is when it starts going to the – when the states that are receiving it are strong enough 
to use it really effectively for their own political ends. I think right now a lot of states in Africa don't have that organization cap- organizational capability the same way maybe states in Latin America have, have developed it. And that's I think that's when it will become trickier. So let's close with the following um, question and I, your work really brings this to, to the forefront of my mind at least. You talk a lot in, in, in many of your papers about skills versus capital and we've talked about it today. You're you, know, you give somebody a grant and or just cash and they, they decide how much to invest in skills, how much in raw materials, how much in a piece of equipment that might help them. And this, there's obvious uh, – there's an obvious Hayekian uh, knowledge problem that's being solved by the person close to the problem and there's some advantages to that. What I worry about – and this is what Nina Monk concluded fairly or not or accurately or not when she looked at the end of the Millennium Village Project. She said – when I interviewed her, she said something like, well, nothing grew. There were no occupations. There was no industry. There was no long-run effect. There was no transformation. There were no markets. And we, when you describe these these very desperately poor, these desperately poor people earning $350 a year uh, and now they can be a hairstylist or they can do something else, uh, they can provide a service. But there are no companies. There's no firms. There's no capital – that's being aggregated in a way that happens in Western society. And the way we would describe it as economists is there are really markets. There's markets for skills in the sense that people hire other mm-hmm. people to do stuff for them. But you don't get that next level. And and that seems to be – that's what real growth allows and creates. And that's that's what we really would like to hope for. What are your thoughts on mm-hmm. that? And let's close with that. So I, I, I agree. Um Something like the Millennium Villages or the kinds of programs I've studied are not are not going to achieve this kind of you know what people sometimes call structural transformation. You know the the whole the shift from into an industrial economy and large firms and um, this is going to this this kind of cottage industry is is providing growth. I mean it's it's helping it's helping these individuals in these villages do well. Uh, and doing 10 or 20 or 40 percent better than before is actually a pretty big improvement. And in historical terms, in long run historical terms, that's a great improvement, especially over a few years. So that strikes me as a really good thing to still do. Uh, but it's a little bit like what I said towards the beginning, which is that that's not really what you know big development is about in the sense of this structural transformation. And they're really two different processes and two different objectives and and um, it's not even clear that they're that related to one another. Uh, so I think they're just happening at very different levels and have very different drivers. So you can think of what I'm talking about as, as in some sense, the kinds of things one can do to relieve the worst forms of poverty. Because it's not – these people, the bottom people who I've been – dealing with are not the ones who are going to initially share in any industrial gains. Places like Uganda and Ethiopia, where I also work in Liberia, are industrializing in some ways. I think you'll see East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, maybe Uganda industrialize a great deal in the next 20 years. But the people I'm working with are not going to share in that and for for generations potentially. And so you can think of this as, as another focus of development that's really aiming at relieving the worst forms of poverty for that quote unquote bottom billion uh, as this other process is going on. Uh, the problem is when the aid industry, which I think has happened, and I think things like the Millennium Villages contribute to, the thing is when those draw the attention of the average scholar or the average politician or the average uh, U.S. president away from the important thing, which is the kinds of things that drive structural transformation, uh, when it when it pulls attention entirely away from those, uh, and you can go into UN Millennium Development Goal strategy documents for 15 years, and you can do a search as I have for the word firm, and industry, and you can fail to find it. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem, and so we we need to sort of there's two balls. And as policy individuals or as citizens or as whatever we are, we need to keep our eye on both of them and not not let one of them uh, overtake – not let any one of them you know, overtake it, the other in importance. Well, it strikes me we're not very good at one of those balls, that structural transformation. And what I'm 
impresses me about your work is that you actually it seems that we might actually make some difference, positive difference, and that's it's worth something, and it shouldn't be ignored or, or treated as unimportant. Yeah, you know, you have to. If st- structural transformation might be more important, but we might know less what to do about it. I, I'm a little more optimistic than some, but but that might that might that might mean we focus a little bit more on the thing we know how to do. But but I think it also means we in the scholarly community, we in academia maybe have to invest more energy and resources in that basic research around understanding, learning more about that thing that has higher impact, the structural transformation. My guest today has been Chris Blattman. Chris, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.